All right, perfect. I think we're live. Um, hello, everyone. This is uh, Abdullah, the uh, Oxford Energy Society president, 2021-2022. Um, um, we're currently presenting our first talk of the term. Um, we are honored to present to you Professor Sir Chris Smith, um, who's going to speak us today about how can the future or can future energy needs be met sustainably? Um, I'll give a brief introduction about the society. Um, so we're a student-run society that focuses on energy and climate change. Uh, we want to bridge uh, students with the industry and academia. Uh, we have a suite of events um, in Hillary and also Miklamas terms every year. Um, we have an event each week, um, so please do um, schedule that in your calendars. We usually run them from every Wednesday from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Um, we really appreciate um, having uh, Chris with us here today. Um, so he's going to speak about global energy, um, how global energy consumption is rising globally, um, driven by living standards in developing countries. And um, he will explain to us um, how can we meet this increase in consumption uh, globally um, by more sustainable resources and more sustainable consumption. Um, Professor Sir Chris Smith is a theoretical physicist. Um, he currently is interested in all aspects of energy, um, supply and also demand, um, especially energy storage, in which he is leading a Royal Society study at the moment. Chris has served as the Director of Energy Research um, in Oxford University between 2011 and 2017. Um, he's also been a President of the Council of Synchronization Light of Experimental Science and Application in the Middle East between 20, 2008 and 2017, or until 2017. Um, he, he has written and spoken widely in science funding. Um, international scientific collaboration and energy issues. He served in many advisory bodies nationally and internationally. We're so lucky to have him here with us today. Um, this is gonna be, again, our first talk of the event uh, or, or of the term as well. Uh, so please stay tuned. Um, Chris, the mic is yours and thank you for having us. Okay, so uh, you can hear me all right, Abdullah? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Very good. So I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I was struck down by the dreaded virus a few days ago, so I'm feeling okay. Uh, so since this is the first talk of the year, I thought I would give a rather wide-ranging talk, um, which will form the basis for future talks and future events and for discussion at the end of this session if we have any time left. Now, sustainability means that we must get to net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases. And you know this as well as I do to prevent, we need this to prevent disastrous climate change. But there are a couple of other reasons. As a bonus, it will reduce air pollution, which uh, recent estimates think is causing something like 18% um, of all deaths. Of course, the real question is, how much you're going to die anyway you can't you can't increase the number of deaths uh, how many years of life are lost maybe typically 10 years for each of those deaths it's not clear uh, as another bonus and i've been saying this for some years but only this year people have started to understand what i was talking about by freeing ourselves from fossil fuels we will take ourselves out of the orbit of some of the countries that provide uh, fossil fuels. And for example, this will free Russian uh, German foreign policy from Russia. Of course, it may be out of the frying pan into the fire because um, we'll need other things for in the sustainable world, which are controlled, some of them by relatively few countries. I'll come back to that. Now, the first thing I want to discuss while I'm in the introduction is why emissions must stop not just slow down, and then I'll discuss how the world's doing. Then I'm going to focus particularly on CO2 emissions produced by the energy sector. And after discussing where we are today and why it's difficult, 
discuss in most of the talk how we should decarbonize. Now, uh, you've probably all seen pictures or plots showing the global, the temperature of the atmosphere rising as a function of time. But these things are very noisy, these plots. They jump up and down because the um, solar irradiation varies a bit from year to year. We get volcanoes that blot out the sun and so on. But although the temperature of the atmosphere is rising in a slightly stochastic random way, it is steadily going up, um, that rising temperature is being transferred to the ocean. And that transfer just depends on the temperature difference. So some of the noise in the annual increase uh, is smoothed out. And I think if you want one piece of evidence, this is a rather convincing graph. This shows the temperature in the top 2,000 meters or the heat stored in the top 2,000 meters of the ocean from 1960 onwards. And you see it going rather smoothly up. This change here, by the way, of slope, that's about the point where China started to industrialize in a big way. Now, we all know that the effects of climate change are being seen. You know, floods, droughts, forest fires, and there could be tipping points, such as the melting of glaciers in Antarctica and Greenland and so on. And we really have to avoid these things happening. Now, why is it that to avoid these things, we have to not just slow down emissions, we have to stop? So here's a plot, it's a little bit out of date, but it serves a purpose. And this shows somebody or other's projection of global CO2 emissions rising more or less linearly until whoever drew this plot thought that we got enough fossil fuels, we'd have enough even in a business as usual situation if we did nothing by the year 2100. So the emissions are at the moment, this is historical data here, going up more or less linearly. But the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is going up faster than linearly because we're putting it up faster than it comes down. It comes down as some of it goes into the ocean or the land, and then there's a new, uh, then it stabilizes. Um, uh, and in fact, in the long run, a CO2 will only come down over tens of thousands of years when it leads to changes in rocks. Now, what happens if we suddenly drop to zero on this blue plot here? Well, what would happen is that the atmospheric CO2 would start to go down slightly because we're no longer putting it up and some of it that's in the atmosphere will be absorbed in the oceans with a time constant of about 300 years and there'll be a new equilibrium between the CO2 in the atmosphere and in the oceans. So there will be a slight drop here. On the other hand, the temperature will go up, have a tendency to go on going up because at this point here, where we imagine switching off emissions, there's more heat coming into the earth than going out. And just because we stop emissions, that will not suddenly change. So at this point, if we were to switch off emissions, there are two conflicting tendencies. The driving force, the CO2 in the atmosphere, will go down to uh, over about 300 years, maybe drop about 20%. On the other hand, the temperature will go up and the temperature will go up until a new equilibrium is reached between the temperature in the atmosphere and the temperature in the oceans. So the time constant of that is the time for the heat in the atmosphere to reach the deep ocean. So it's also about 300 years. So if we switch off, there are two conflicting tendencies. One, the driving force goes down with a time constant of about 200, 300 years. Two, the temperature is trying to go up with a time constant of about 300 years. And when you talk to the people who model these things, they say these effects cancel out. So if we switched off emissions completely, according to the modelers, the temperature will stay constant. Now, that's not a theorem. It's a cancellation between two effects. And it's plausible that they're of the same magnitude with the same time constant, but it's not actually a theorem. It could be worse than that. Anyway, in the absence of a theorem, we have to assume that it's not enough to stop emissions. If you want the temperature not to go on rising, 
we have to stop emissions altogether. Now that's just CO2, but there are other, um, oh, let me go back. There are other greenhouse gases which have other effects and I won't have much time to say much about those. Now, how are we doing? Here, going back to, I can't read the scale here, 19, uh, 1900, I think, is the CO2 in the atmosphere. And you can see that after the Second World War, since then, it's been rising more or less linearly. Uh, there was a slight drop because of COVID, 5.8% in 2020. But in 2019, 2021, it rebounded again, and it's going on up. So this rising emissions, we want to go to zero, but it's on a tendency going up. So that's going to be extremely difficult. If we add in CO2 emissions from changes of land use and some simulation of the effect of other greenhouse gases, this is what's happening to the total equivalent emissions. They're just going up with a slight drop here, but they're now going up again. And you see the worst culprit is today China, followed by the United States, and the UK is uh, down here somewhere, a relatively small amount. I have Turkey on here because I made this slide to give a talk in Turkey. So that's what's been happening in the past. What's going to happen in the future? Well, here again is a historical trend. These are CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels. This is the trajectory in green we ought to be on to get to net zero. If we got onto that net zero trajectory, the temperature rise relative to pre-industrial temperatures will be about one and a half degrees. Today, we're about just over one degree and it's having very serious effect. One and a half degrees is gonna be a lot worse, but it's quite difficult to imagine this trajectory here getting onto the green curve here. What about these other curves? The blue curve is if every government that's announced or enacted policies to deal with climate change delivers on them, we'd be on this blue change curve. So the rise would change, uh, slow down, but the temperature would go up by getting on for more than two and a half degrees, which would be catastrophic. So we don't want to be there. What are these lines? These are the pledges made in the climate conferences, the last one in Glasgow last year, and that climate treaty is entirely voluntary. Countries volunteer to make cuts. And these were the uh, offers on the table, the top of these lines, the top of the higher of these two lines before the COP meeting. Those would have led to this temperature change here. But during the conference, people got a bit bolder and said, oh, we won't be here, we'll be down here somewhere. But it still takes you to pretty near two degrees. But we're not on this trajectory. So this is not good news at all but we need to get onto this trajectory and we'll discuss later how that might be done. Now, I'm going to talk about energy. Uh, where's our energy coming from? So this is an international energy, IEA, uh, projection of energy use um, <coughs> from 1990 up to quite recently. And you see <coughs> the dominant amounts are coming from coal, natural gas, and oil. So they are fossil fuels. Now, there's a very odd feature of this graph that I want to draw attention to for energy freaks. Uh, you see here nuclear and hydro. Now, nuclear is used to make electricity, and hydro is used to make electricity. And hydro makes about 50% more electricity than nuclear. So why is nuclear looking bigger on this chart than hydro? And the reason for that is that the International Energy Agency, uh, rather pedantically, says primary energy, it says, well, nuclear may make electricity, but the first thing it makes is heat. So it puts the amount of heat from nuclear in here, but that only makes only about a third of that goes into electricity. So this is exaggerating the role of nuclear relative to hydro. On the other hand, it isn't really treating wind and solar correctly because they make direct um, electricity directly. So what you really ought to do is translate everything into one unit, 
which would be the amount of fossil fuels you need to produce that energy if it were produced by fossil fuels. So you could say, if hydro were produced by fossil fuels or by heat, you'd have to multiply it by three. And if the wind and solar were produced by fossil fuels, they'd be multiplied by three. And that then gives you the relative role. But you see, the, uh, the things that are carbon neutral, nuclear, hydro, wind, and solar, however much I try and de de redefine them, they're pretty small compared to fossil fuels. Now, if we look at the trend over a much longer time scale, so this goes back to 1900, uh, these are percentages, not absolute values. So don't get the impression from this that the use of coal has gone down. It's gone up colossally, especially since 1900 back here. But the relative amount of coal has gone down. We've been through an oil age, then now we're moving into a natural gas age. Now you can see, you can get shifts between, let's say, uh, oil and natural gas or coal and natural gas, but they tend to take very long periods, like a hundred years here. So it's quite difficult to believe, but we have to make it happen, however hard it is to believe, that somehow the uh, renewables, and this is the renewables in BP's rapid change scenario, can take over. So in BP's rapid change scenario, by 2050, the renewables rise a lot to 40% of the total. That's good, but we want 100%, so it's going to be very tough. Now, before I get to how to do it, let me just give two other plots which show how difficult it's going to be. So the first of these is to do with what's called committed emissions. What are those? Well, this plot's a little bit out of date, but when it, I couldn't get a recent version. When it was made in 2017, there was a certain amount of fossil uh, electricity generation from fossil fuels. And the authors of this said, let's suppose that from 2017 onwards, we don't build any more fossil fuel generation of electricity, but we just take the generation that exists, the capacity that exists, and assume that it runs until its lifetime is over. So it's just run down. Uh, and if you did that, that would produce the, whatever that is, 358 tons of CO2. Then you can do the same thing for CO2 produced in industry. That says deep blue. And then you could say, supposing at this date, all cars became electric, uh, but you just ran the existing cars into the ground that will produce this blue slice here. And if you add up all these things, you'd have got 658 gigatons of CO2. That's bigger than the budget we have left to stay within one and a half degrees. And that was in 2017, and already then there was a lot more planned, this light green area, and since then a lot more has been built. So we're on a trajectory that unless a lot of investors are prepared to see things at which they put money switched off, it's more or less inevitable that we're gonna go well over one and a half degrees. Now, the other way, another way of seeing how difficult this is, and one of the major challenges, is to think about how we're going to raise living standards in developing countries while weaning them off carbon dioxide. So this left-hand plot here shows what's called the Human Development Index for lots of different countries, some of whom are named here, uh, plotted against the per capita consumption of energy. Now, the Human Development Agent, uh, the Human Development uh, Index is a mixture of national wealth per person, life expectancy at birth, and um, degree of education. So the people up the top of this curve have, they're rich, they live a long time, and they're well educated. And down the bottom here, they're poor, they don't live very long, and they're not very well educated. Now this plot suggest to you that to get a decent standard of living, you need to have more energy. So we'd like to see countries, as far as our living standards are concerned, moving up this curve. That's fine, 
except when we look at the CO2, because when we look at CO2 per capita, we want all the countries that are up here, like us, for example, moving down to zero. And the countries that are moving up here in energy, we'd like them to be moving up in energy, but down in CO2. And that's not happening. It happened, I put on here for a talk I was giving in India, the situation in India. This is where India was uh, in, I can't read the scale where, uh, but anyway, this is about 10 years difference in India and the energy consumption has improved and the human development index has improved. But unfortunately, that has all been fed by greater use of fossil fuels. So they're not on the trajectory to bring us down here. So it's going to be very difficult. Okay, now I'm going to switch gear and come to how we might decarbonize. And there are basically three ways of doing it. We can reduce the amount of energy we use or the amount of carbon dioxide associated with that energy. Um, that's easy to say. It's not so easy to do in practice. What would it mean? It means planning cities so people use public transport rather than drive cars. It means eating less meat um, and so on. So uh, that's a, a good thing to aspire to do, but it's very difficult to say how much we would gain from that. Then we can use energy more efficiently. And that's absolutely essential, but it's very difficult to realize the savings in energy that are in principle possible. And it's not happening, and I want to discuss why. So if we go over here, again, this plot's a bit old. If we'd taken this plot back to 1960, from 1960 to about 1990, every time world wealth increased, let's say 10%, energy use went up 10%. They just moved in lockstep. Now, uh, since 1900, uh, sorry, since 1990, there's been a decoupling. Energy has since then been going up slightly less rapidly than GDP, so that's good, but it's still been going up. On the other hand, globally, CO2 has been going up. Every time energy went up 10%, CO2 went up 10%, but we want it to go to zero. But it's starting to decouple, although this is a projection. The EU is doing somewhat better than the world as a whole. This is the GDP in the EU. This is a projection, so it hasn't actually happened yet. Uh, this is the GDP. This is the energy per unit of GDP. And you can see it's decoupling, but it's still going up. And we want it to go to zero. And this is the CO2 per unit of GDP. So these are good trends, but they're not enough. First of all, this is only a projection. It hasn't happened. And secondly, we want the CO2 to go to zero, not just to go down. Now, why is it so difficult to get energy savings? If you read the energy savings experts, you'll find statements like it's quite possible to save 40%, 50%, 60%, whatever. And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, one is that people are quite affluent and they don't bother. But the other is that um, if uh, energy becomes more efficient, the energy use, it becomes cheaper. And generally, when things become cheaper, people use more of them. So let me tell you uh, the results of an experiment done by a social scientist in Oxford, he's now in Chicago. Uh, he got hold of the heating bills for people in social housing in Camden. These are relatively poor people. And on half the bills, they put in big letters, if you turn down your thermostat one degree, uh, you would save you know, two pounds a week or something. And they stood back to see how much those people saved. But it's not what happened at all. These were poor people who'd had the thermostat changed, could turn down, and were rather cold. And they said, damn it, if it's only two pounds a week, I'm going to turn the thermostat up. So it's very, very important when to asking people to save energy to give the message in a right way. And also, uh, it, as you just make energy more efficient, as I said, it gets cheaper, people will use more of it. That's called the rebound effect. That's a direct rebound effect. But there's an indirect rebound effect. 
which is if you're spending less money on energy, you've got more money to spend on other things. And those other things will involve energy. So the only thing which will really do the job is regulation. And luckily now we see that increasing numbers of buildings, transport, industry, uh, and so on, are subject to regulations that are forcing them to save energy. Now, I think I'm gonna skip this slide. I'll leave it available if people want to look at it, but it, it dramatically shows the effect that regulation can have on energy consumption. Now I want to come to the parts of the economy that are difficult to decarbonize, what I call the stubborn sectors. So let's first of all, I've looked a little bit at where your, uh, the energy comes from. Let's look at how it's used. So if you buy energy, you can buy electricity. You use that for an enormous number of different things. You buy it to move your car or fly a plane or drive a truck for transport. And you provide it for heat, to heat your house or industrial heat uh, to drive chemical processes. And in terms of this final energy, uh, about 48% is in heat, 32% in transport, 20% in electricity. Now, this is, raises the question, why is it that if um, electricity is only 20% of final energy, it's what most talks about energy are about electricity? And there's a cynical reason for that, which is that electricity is relatively easy to decarbonize, so people like to talk about it whereas heat is much harder, so they don't like to talk about it. But a more serious reason is that uh, this is final energy. Now, if you get heat, uh, I mean, if you burn gas, it makes heat. Heat is heat. But if you make electricity, most of it comes from burning coal or gas, and only a small fraction of that goes into electricity because of the second law of thermodynamics. It's very efficient, inefficient. So if you ask to produce X amount of electricity, how much heat do you need? You probably need three times as much. That pushes up electricity. If you look at transport, there is about an 8% loss in refining oil. So actually, the primary energy to drive transport is bigger than the energy you use up with. But if I push up the electricity to account for the inefficiency and the transport, leave heat alone, I get to more than 100%, so I have to scale everything down again. And if you get to primary energy, you end up with about 40% electricity, 35% heat, still very important, and 25% in transport. Now, uh, here I've put the various forms, and in black, the things that are hard to decarbonize. Industrial heating, we'll come to that very hard, space and water heating. Light vehicles, relatively easy, batteries. Heavy vehicles, a bit harder. Marine aviation, very difficult. Uh, electricity is relatively easy. We know how to decarbonize electricity. But on the other hand, in decarbonizing the other things, we're gonna use more and more electricity. So it's a moving target. Now, before I get to the, this in terms of CO2, there's an important point, which is, when you buy electricity, you can buy it from companies that claim all their electricity is green, and that makes you feel good. But the, ele the electrons that come out of the plug don't know whether they're green electrons or black electrons, and it makes no difference to your behavior. So uh, how you provide electricity has no impact on lifestyles. On the other hand, how you get around does have an impact on your lifestyle and how you heat your home. If you've got a heat pump, you need different pattern of heating through the day than if you're just burning gas. So these uh, heat and transport are more people sensitive than looking at electricity. And we need to look at the whole system, heat, transport, electricity, markets, economics, policies, and consumer acceptance it's no good uh, coming up with some wonderful green scream if nobody's prepared to use it. Okay, now I'm going to a plot which shows you where CO2 emissions are coming from. So this is a global plot. So as we've already seen, electricity, we just had it, was 48% of all energy. 
it's something like 40%, 8% of all CO2 emissions. So this is a very major, it's the biggest contributor. We know how to decarbonize it in principle. I'm going to discuss that at length, but it's growing rapidly as electricity takes over in these other sectors. Heat, heat of buildings and industrial heat, that's the next biggest individual sector. Uh, heat to make cement, to make iron and steel, to make ammonia, whatever. That's much harder, and I'll give examples of how that might be done. Transport, light road transport, that's going to be batteries, that's easy. Heavy road transport may well also be batteries, we don't know. Air traffic is relatively small, but it's growing very rapidly. That's difficult. Shipping also growing very rapidly. I think we know how to do that. Rail is, can easily be done. That's relatively small. Now, I want to just take two examples of these hard to decarbonize sectors, iron and steel and cement. Oh, first, again, efficiency is absolutely vital. So this tells you what can be done in principle with efficiency. So this is an EU slide that shows, whoop, gone forward one too far. This shows CO2 emissions in 2050 if we go with business as usual from steel, making steel in the EU, making plastics, making aluminium and making cement. Those are the big ones. Now, these are in principle savings. These are uh, materials recirculation. So that's reusing uh, aluminium, steel, and so on. So in principle, of this 530, you could save 178 in principle. Then this next slot is called product materials efficiency. What that means is when you mill aluminium, for example, instead of letting the bits just lie on the floor and sweeping them up and throwing them away, you sweep them up, melt them down, and put them back again. So this gives you another saving. And finally here, these are what are called circular business models. Well, circular business models uh, means things like car sharing, office sharing. And of course, that's been growing because of COVID, though this is a pre-COVID slide. So whoever wrote this slide said, oh, look, in principle, we could save 56% of what we would otherwise be producing in 2050. So that's fine, except for the fact we'd like to save 100%, and except for the fact that this isn't necessarily happening. This is just what can happen in principle. So now let me come to the example of steel. So how is steel made? You've got iron ore, you grind it up, that takes energy, uh, and then you put it into a blast furnace. And in the blast furnace, it's mixed with coke, uh, the coke makes carbon monoxide, and there's a reaction that carbon monoxide plus iron oxide makes carbon dioxide plus iron. So you end up with iron, and then you make steel. The trouble is that the reaction here that is uh, reducing the iron oxide to iron produces CO2. And in the, all the steel making, almost all the steel making in the world, that's just vented into the atmosphere. Now, you could try to capture it and put it underground, but the trouble is it's rather dilute. And in order to do that, first of all, you can't capture all of it. You'd have to redesign the furnace and it would cost you money. There is an alternative, which is to say there's another reaction. Iron oxide plus hydrogen makes water plus iron. So what you could do is take the iron oxide, make iron pellets using carbon-free fuels, then make hydrogen with electrolysis from water. I'll discuss that a bit later. And then with the hydrogen, reduce the iron oxide to iron. And there is a scheme inside at Scandinavia to do that uh, as a trial. So this is good. Uh, the baseline is that making, according to the Scandinavians, making steel by the normal route will produce about 1.6 tons of CO2 per ton of iron. Whereas by this route, it'd be 25 kilos per ton of iron. So you've gained a factor of whatever that is, that's a factor of well over a thousand. So that's really good news. 
but the bad news is I've put the cost up. Now, if I move to cement, it's a similar story. Cement is growing, use is growing rapidly because of building in the third world and raising of its living standards. But if, to make cement, you take um, basically limestone and you heat it up and it drives off the carbon monoxide and you're left with uh, basically cement. Now, um, this is produces an awful lot of CO2. There are ways of getting around it, but you can make it more efficient. You can look for alternatives. You can use less concrete and so on and so forth. But this is a really difficult one. And according to a body called the Energy Transitions Commission, cement decarbonization is likely to lead to a significant increase in cement prices and could account for something like 60% of the global cost of decarbonizing all the harder to abate industrial sectors. So there are some real challenges out there and there are research challenges like finding cheaper substitutes for cement. Now, uh, what I want to come to now is electricity. And I'll spend the rest of the talk on electricity. So these are the sources of electricity today. And you see it's mostly coming from coal, followed by natural gas, uh, then there's hydro producing more than nuclear, although nuclear produce starts with more heat. Here's oil, there's some electricity produced by oil, and here are the renewables. Now, the problem with this is that when we go back here, we see that decarbonizing a lot of these sectors here is going to mean more electricity. So we're going to need more electricity so we total is going to go up, and yet we want the primary components, coal, gas, uh, and oil. Well, nuclear is a big one on hydro. We want those to go to zero. If you look at the renewables here, here are solar, PV, and wind. The hope is that these will go from this level to 2050, which is over here somewhere, uh, to 100% of a bigger total. So that's not terribly easy to imagine, but we've got to try and make it happen. Uh, now, how can we do that? Um, so what are the ways to, oh, I put it here. The ways of getting low carbon electricity are gas with carbon capture and storage, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, nuclear, uh, wind and solar, but then you worry about the fact that the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. And I'll have a lot to say about that. And of course, there is, new, there is hydro here. But in the UK, we're getting close to the limit of the amount of hydro. There's not scope for increasing it. Now, carbon capture and storage. So the idea here is we have a power plant. And then in the fluke here, there's carbon dioxide and nitrogen and a lot of rubbish coming out. You can have coast combustion capture. You can try and capture the CO2 in that. You can pressurize it and put it underground. Now, the problem with that is it would add 30% to the cost of power. The capture isn't perfect. Some of it will leak. And there are upstream emissions of, of methane. If you're in a gas power plant or at coal, there's methane from, from coal mines. So in getting the fossil fuels to the power station, there are leakages of methane which produce climate change. So I think that using CCS, you can make it more efficient by burning impure oxygen and things like that, but still it's expensive. I don't see any point in that. There are alternative ways like using wind and solar. So I think carbon capture and storage should be mainly kept for making steel and cement uh, where there aren't many alternatives, although you can use it in principle and power. The other thing you could do, which is a very interesting idea, is use carbon capture and storage with biofuels. So when you grow biomass, it absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. If you then burn the biomass, to make electricity, let's say, uh, it emits CO2. But if you can capture that and put it underground, you're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, taking it out of the flue gas here, 
and you're burying it underground. So this is carbon negative in principle. The problem with that is that's only true if the biomass is carefully sourced from people who are growing it in a sustainable way and not digging up virgin forests and so on. And it, the other problem is there's a limit to how much we can get in the UK. Maybe we could get something like 50 terawatt hours of electricity from bioenergy and carbon capture and storage, but that's only about 10% of the electricity we're going to need in 2050. So this would be helpful, but it's not going to solve the problem. So what we need uh, is something else, and one other thing could be nuclear. Now, the Achilles heel of nuclear has been the cost, where in Europe and North America, there's been a terrible record. So on this plot here, this is a study by the Energy Technology Institute. This shows the cost, I'll explain how it's got in a minute, of the most recently built or being built nuclear power stations in Europe and North America. And this shows the cost in the rest of the world. So clearly, we are doing something wrong compared with the rest of the world. Now, before I come to what we're doing wrong, what are these bars here? One of the difficulties is that the, is that the cost in comparing the cost of nuclear in different places is that the cost of nuclear power depends very strongly on what you pay to borrow money, the so-called discount rate because you know, it could take you 10 years to build a nuclear power station. And during that, you're using up money and you're not generating anything. So what you pay for the money you're borrowing in that era is very, very important. So what the Energy Technology Institute did is said, we'll take all these power plants and we'll assume they all paid the same amount, 7% to borrow money. And then they said, this is what would happen if they paid 9%. And at the bottom of this, this is what happened if they paid 6%. So you can see it's incredibly sensitive to the cost of borrowing money. And then they said, if we learned all the lessons we could from over here, this maybe we could get this down to something like 60 pounds a megawatt hour. But that's not happening. The fact is, nuclear is looking still very expensive. Now, you've probably heard a lot about the idea of small modular reactors. So this is the idea that instead of building a few big power plants, we build a lot of small ones. Now, as a physicist or engineer, at first sight, that seems like a bad idea because the cost is in the surface. The thing that contains the nuclear reactor was well, the amount of power you get out is in the volume. So the bigger you make it, you know, the, the smaller the surface compared to the volume. So the cost ought to go down in bigger reactors, but it doesn't because they take longer to build and all sorts of cock-ups have been made. So the idea instead is to make a lot of small units, maybe many units on one site. So it's the same people who build the first, the second, the third, the fourth have learned how to do it. And there'll be production learning, standardization, a shorter build schedule. So we'll pay less in borrowing this money here. And there'll be finance savings. Now, this is a very interesting idea. And it may be that it puts down the cost of nuclear, but it's never been tested. We need not just to build one. We need to build three or four to see if it's true that the cost comes down. And that has not yet been done, unfortunately. So I don't have great hopes for nuclear bailing us out. So what does that leave us with? It leaves us with wind and solar. Now, this is a plot that shows the cost as a function of time of solar PV generated electricity, uh, of onshore wind and of offshore wind. This gray area here is a sort of generation cost in US dollars per kilowatt hour from burning fossil fuels. And by the way, the cost of the new Hinkley Point power station, the big one under construction in summertime, will be about here where I've got the cursor. So wind and solar are already well below the nuclear cost and they're getting to the bottom and these are going down. This is slightly out of date. If you go to the International Renewable Energy Agency, you can find an updated copy of this, but I can tell you it just goes on down. 
uh, is getting to the bottom of the range for fossil fuels. So that sounds like very good news, except for the fact that that's the cost and the value is not the same thing as the cost because wind can be as cheap as you like, but if it's only blowing at night when nobody wants it, it's not much use. And it's not always available. There are times when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining. So this brings me to my last major topic before I try and reach some conclusions, which is about the issue of intermittency. Now, this is a slightly complicated slide uh, based on a model made by JP Morgan. It's a really stupid model actually, but it illustrates the point I want to make. So what's assumed here, this, this is um, the, a winter of 2015, and this black line is energy de electricity demand in Germany scaled down 25%. So these people said, we're going to become more efficient, so electricity demand is going to go down. Well, yes, we are going to become more efficient, but we're going to use more electricity in electric cars, heating, and so on. So I don't, I don't think the absolute value of this should be believed. This is the same thing in summer. That's the actual demand in 2015 scaled down 25%. Then they assume there's a certain amount of hydro and uh, biomass running around the clock at the bottom here. And then they said, we'll take the current wind in 2015 and suppose about three times as much, that's in blue, and the current solar, that's in orange, and assume there was twice as much. So sort of on average, you're getting roughly the same amount of wind and solar and bio as you're getting demand, but there are gaps here. Now, in fact, demand's gonna go up and the wind and solar are gonna go up much more than this, but this makes the point. Now, it, you immediately see from this that this is fine, except for the fact that there are times when there's more than enough, here, the wind is more than the demand. Here, the solar is more than demand. And there's times here when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. So on average, I could scale up wind and solar more so that on average, it met demand, but it won't meet it in practice. And in particular, there are times here when there is essentially no wind and solar. And if I'd looked over a longer period, and I'm going to tell you some results looking over 37 years later, uh, you will see that this happens quite often. And there are quite long periods with no wind and solar. So to deal with this, uh, what do you need? You can try to manage demand, but you'll never shift this demand, the demand here to happen here. I mean, here are de whole days when people need heat and they need to heat their houses and so on. So that will help if I can move demand a little bit, but it won't solve the problem. I could go to a larger grid so I could connect Germany to other areas where the wind is blowing and the sun is shining. Uh, we'll come back to that. That would help, but it won't fix the problem. So the only solution actually is to store the excesses here and put them back again when there's a gap. Now, before I come to that, Let's note the following, that as wind and solar go up, the amount of energy that the rest of the system has to provide goes down. So uh, this gap here is only, I don't know what it is, 20-20% of the total demand. So whatever is filling this gap only has to provide 20% of the energy. But at this point, when there's no wind and solar, it has to provide almost 100% of the power, all except the green bit. So it's very inefficient. Whatever's filling these gaps is sitting idle a lot of the time. So it's going to be extremely expensive. So whatever you get from storage or whatever else to match high levels of wind and renewables is going to be very expensive. That sounds like bad news, but it's not as bad as it seems because although this bit that matches wind and solar is going to be expensive, it's only providing 25% or whatever of the energy. So the average cost may be acceptable, but you've got to think in terms of the average cost. Now, uh, large grids, they would help 
And there are, in China, there are large grids, there are plans around the world. There's even a plan to provide an underseas link between Morocco and the UK, somewhat politically vulnerable, uh, and so on. But the large grids can help, but they won't solve the problem. So let me come now to storage. So when we study high levels, the Great Britain, uh, Ireland is separate. Northern Ireland is part of an integrated energy market with Southern Ireland, so it's normally treated separately. If we look at Great Britain, with high levels of wind and solar, the analysis of the meteorological data reveals a need to saw many tens of terawatt hours for periods of years. I'll put that in context in a minute, what this many tens, oh, or maybe I'll put it in context now. People think that we have a lot of storage in pumping water up into dams. Pumping water up into dams uh, can store at maximum about 30 gigawatt hours. We're going to need many, several, more like 100 terawatt hours. So we're going to use 3,000 times more energy from storage than we can get from dams. So we're going to need something really new and very big. And the only thing that can really do it is storing hydrogen in solution mined salt caverns, for which there is an adequate potential in Great Britain. Now, before coming to this, just a very brief interlude on the hydrogen economy. You've probably all heard a lot of talk about hydrogen. And the question I want to ask, is this hype or hope? I think hydrogen has many uses. It can produce high temperature heat in industry. It might be able to reduce space heating. Uh, it might be used in light vehicles, not so obvious. We can use batteries, possibly in heavy vehicles, maybe in marine, maybe in aviation. And it can be used to uh, make steel and so on, as we've discussed, and produce the heat we need in cement. But in UK, we are not really in using much uh, and we don't need, we have, we're not an industrialized country anymore. So we don't need this here. Space and water heating, I don't think we're going to go down that route. So I think in Great Britain, the main use will be for electricity storage. But there is still a big debate here. It's very controversial. The people who produce gas want to produce a lot of gas to turn it into what's called blue hydrogen. And the people who run the gas networks want to produce a, a lot of blue hydrogen to put in the gas network. The trouble with that is the scale is uh, that we can do this is limited because there are emissions that we can't get rid of. But in the rest of the world, I think that there will be a hydrogen and ammonia economy. And here's an example of the scale of things that people thinking. This is a diagram of a big facility which is planned, maybe even being built now in Northwest Saudi Arabia, which will produce a lot of ammonia. And that's a good thing in its own right to make ammonia, which is heavily used to, as a fertilizer and produces a lot of CO2. If we can make ammonia from hydrogen, uh, then we can save a lot of CO2. Ammonia is easy to ship. So the idea is we ship it around the world and then either use it as ammonia or turn it back into fossil fuels. Now, let me go back to storage. Uh, how are we going to do it? Um, if we're going to use it, we've got to first of all make hydrogen. So we use that by using electrolyzers to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And there are different options here which have different positive and negative sides. I won't discuss that, but no doubt it can be done. Storage, the idea is to make a very large number of huge caverns underground. So there is a plan to make caverns of 3,000 cubic meters each, about 1,800 meters underground. This is only about 100 meters high. So there's a split scale here in uh, areas of the country where there is salt. And there is a lot in uh, north, uh, north uh, in East Yorkshire. There's some in Wessex, there's some in um, Cheshire. So you, you drive down water, it dissolves the salt, and then you push down the water using air or maybe natural gas uh, and pump the water out again until you've dissolved it and made a huge cavern. 
and then you have to convert it into electricity. That's easily done with fuel cells or very likely better with four stroke engines. Now, uh, before I come to my conclusions, modeling storage in the GB, this is what I've mainly been working on. There's some, in order to model how much storage we need, you have to compare hour by hour or better half hour by half hour or even minute by minute, but the data doesn't exist. You have to compare the wind and solar with what you think demand will be. Well, we don't know what demand will be in 2050. So we have to guess how much electricity we'll need. And then we have to make a model for how it will be used hour by hour. And then we have to prepare them. In doing this, we looked at 37 years of weather data. So we were quite pleased with that at first, but then we began to suspect it's not enough. So one of the strong messages from our uh, study is don't believe the results on storage, which only looked at a few years. That is to say, almost all of them. The biggest one recently done for Bayes, the Business Energy and Industry Ministry, was based on a few periods. And you shouldn't believe it. It just gets the wrong answer. You've got to look at very, very long periods. Uh, the result is that we could power Great Britain at an acceptable cost with wind and solar uh, supported by hydrogen storage. We looked at how we'll need something else, a very small amount of storage, which can respond very rapidly to regulate the voltage and the frequency could come from batteries. It could be that there are other things added, and I've given a whole list of those, and adding some of those could lower the cost but it's very difficult to model with many different types of stores and the costs of hydrogen are uncertain enough. All these other things are even less story, um, certain. So what we did is to begin with, we said, let's look at hydrogen alone. And if adding these things put the cost down, good. We've got an upper bound. So this is sort of a, a, a bound, if you like. And these are the results. And I'm not supposed to tell you them until this report is signed off by the Royal Society. But basically, we are saying that we could, with the different, these are different range, different assumptions about the cost of wind and solar, different assumptions about the costs of storage technologies, different assumptions about what it costs to borrow money, that it could have cost us anywhere from about 30% more than was paid in the last decade to twice as much as paid in the last decade. I don't want to put a number on that. All I can tell you is that this top of this graph here is way below what is going to be paid for nuclear from Hinkley Point and what is being paid for biomass at Drax. And it's way, way below what has been paid over the last year. So this looks as if uh, we could power GP at an acceptable cost. There are various ca caveats, things that have to be confirmed, uncertainties, so on and so forth. Right, now let me try to conclude very quickly because I'm going over time. Meeting the Paris goals of net zero in the second half of the century will be extremely difficult. It's not impossible, but there's a long way to go. We're still at over 80% of fossil fuels, and there's not very much time. Obviously, the problem will be solved if we can find acceptable alternatives that are cheaper than fossil fuels and that were accepted by consumers. We could force the outcome of that by putting a very large carbon price on things. But that whether that be politically acceptable is, is not clear, but we may have to go down that route. But we need to encourage deployment by putting incentives and subsidies and ways of lowering the cost of borrowing money in particular, which will bring the cost down, in a way that gets, uh, gets things started we need to get on with it. And the more we do, we'll learn how to make things cheaper. Countries need to adopt strong targets. We have, I'll discuss it on the next slide, but targets don't solve the problem. We need immediate actions and I'll list some of those. Success will depend on the political will as well as technical developments. And then I want to end up by discussing whether we're near a tipping point. So the UK is sort of a test bed we were the first major country in the world to adopt the target of net zero. Uh, 
and uh, we set up the Independent Committee on Climate Change to monitor how we're doing. And the answer is sort of mixed. Here's a really remarkable thing. This is coal consumption in the UK, going back to the last century, uh, going up and coming down. And today we're about here. Today, we are using less coal in the UK than in 1812, when Napoleon marched into Moscow. Quite remarkable. And we have succeeded in decoupling gross uh, domestic product from emissions. The trouble is the emissions should be going to zero and we're not on course to meet the legally binding targets. There are scenarios that say you can do it, but they rely on a lot of heroic assumptions. On the other hand, back in 2008, whenever it was, when an 80% reduction was set, that looked pretty impossible and now it's looking possible. And I hope and expect that the net zero target will trigger the technical developments which will allow us to hit the target, but it's not obvious. Now, if we're not going to hit it, uh, what can we, well, what things we need to do, all the obvious things that we can do, get on with them, decarbonize electricity, electrify transport, build hydrogen infrastructure, deploy CCS when there are no alternatives, try and make cleaner agriculture, uh, develop all options for greenhouse gas removals, including direct air caption. I've got one slide on that before I finish my second last slide, it'll be. And we probably need a very high carbon price with what are called border carbon adjustments. That is to say, we should be putting a tax on things coming from countries that don't put a high price on carbon. We should say to China, for example, although they are putting a carbon price, if you're, it's unfair competition for you to make steel without a carbon price. So if you want to send us steel, we'll tax the carbon content of that steel. And the logic will be that the Chinese would say, oh, well, why should we let the Brits take the tax? Let's tax it, tax it ourselves. So this will induce other countries to produce carbon taxes. Now, what about negative emissions? The fact is that in almost all scenarios that meet the, the Paris goals, you need to pull a lot of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. This is a shell scenario which says we're going to end up in 2050, even with their best assumptions, with about 20, 10 billion tons a year of CO2, and we want to get rid of that. So you can try and do that with enhanced watering, watering change land use, becks, blah, blah, blah. But it's not going to get you there. And it may well be that we need direct air capture. So these are, for example, these devices here, one of these devices could pull about a, a million tons a year of CO2 out of the atmosphere. So if you want to get 10 thousand million tons, we'd need 10,000s of these things. I hope we don't have to do that. To my mind, the idea of littering the planet with big bits of machinery whose only purpose is to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere will be a pretty terrible thing to do. But on the other hand, if it's the only way to keep the temperature from rising above two degrees and having disastrous flooding, etc., maybe that's what we have to do. Now, I want to discuss, as my last slide, this is it, whether uh, we can imagine things moving much more rapidly than I've suggested in some of the slides I've shown. And this is a slide that suggests it might be possible to make a rapid transition, although I'm then going to call pour cold water on it and tell you why I don't think it follows. So this is a picture of New York in 1900, and you see a lot of horse and buggies. If you look very carefully, there is one car here. So that's New York in 1900. One car, everybody in horse and buggies. Down the bottom here, we've got New York in 1913, all cars. Although if you look very carefully, there is one horse and buggy. So the world, at least New York, not the world, was able in 13 years to move a colossal change in the transport in New York. 
is that a relevant trans uh, precedent? Uh, I'm not convinced. And um, the reason is this doesn't need much infrastructure change. And uh, it's only New York. And the other thing is, there's a huge advantage relative to, to a horse and buggy. These people with a horse and buggy, if they wanted to go out and visit Granny in Connecticut at the weekend, that's pretty difficult to do. But in the car, they could just drive there. So there is a huge incentive. There's a huge improvement in lifestyle from moving from this top slide to the bottom slide. In moving from actual car, the cars we have today to electrical cars, they run more smoothly, but in, in some sense, there's a disadvantage. You get range anxiety and so on. So I think on the one hand, this suggests we can make rapid changes, but I think we shouldn't rely on it. So I think it's going to be very, very difficult to decarbonize. I think it can be done. The big question is, can it be done in time? And for it to happen in time, that's, I'm not going to be around in 2050. Uh, it, we're relying on you, the young people in the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, for the amazing and informative presentation. Now we'd like to open the floor for Q&A sessions. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand and ask your questions. Yeah. Um, in that case, I'll start from the questions on the, the live comments. Thank you for the people who have asked the questions. So the first question is, I think it's about the circular economy that you mentioned. Why is material recirculation emission reduction greater for plastic compared to other materials? Sorry, wait a moment. Let me just see this. It's very hard to hear you. See if I can see this. I've got the, the uh, question comment. Uh, here we go. Um, oh, what's the first one? Is this one about material recirculation? Was that the one you raised? Yeah, I think so. Um, greatest for plastic. I, I think that's because it's so sort of easier to recycle plastics. I don't know the answer to that, actually. If anybody knows, I'd be interested. Um, but uh, I'm not sure. Um, I think it's just because, you know, we're throwing away a lot of plastics into the oceans. It's not being recycled at all. Whereas the other things like aluminium and steel already are being recycled. So the scope for improvement is smaller. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question, which is um, what is bioenergy with CCS? Could you explain it with more oh, details? Okay. Well, I, I thought I had explained it. Let me try again. That means burning uh, wood pellets, for example, and then capturing the carbon dioxide that comes from burning wood pellets and burying it underground carbon capture. CCS, I should have said that, stands for carbon capture and sequestration. Or disp uh, By the way, people often talk about CCSU, which means carbon capture, storage, and use. If anybody does that, ask them what use do they have in mind. It sounds a great idea to use the carbon that you capture, but there aren't any large-scale uses. It's a lot of hype. Anyway, the idea is if we grow trees, that sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere. If we just burn them, it puts the CO2 back in the atmosphere. But if we burn them and put the CO2 underground, we're reducing the CO2 um, in, in the atmosphere. I see. Um, just a quick question. Um, you just mentioned we burn like wood pellets and whatnot, so we all raise these um, advertisements which are popping on the chat. Um, in terms of bioenergy with CCS, you mentioned that burning wood pellets. Are these wood pellets also like from agriculture and then which means it's ultimately yes. decomposing? Yes, it's not just, uh, I mentioned wood pellets, but it could be agricultural waste, for example. Uh, and there are other things. There are wonderful plants called cam plants, which grow with very little water. Uh, things like yucca, um, uh, pineapples, uh, you can grow those in semi-arid land and they've been pushed as an energy crop. So there are other possible sources. 
but it's very difficult to get a very large fraction of our electricity globally from bioenergy. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question, which says... Okay, solar energy. So, yes, there are things going on. And in particular, there's a very, very important uh, development produced by Henry Snaith in the physics department in Oxford of a new sort of materials called perovskites. And uh, perovskites, uh, they're, they're named after a, a Russian geologist called Perovsky, who discovered them in the Urals in the 1890s. There are a whole class of materials with a certain crystal structure. And uh, Henry discovered they make rather good photovoltaics. And um, the if you put them in layers, on top of silicon, which is the current incumbent technology, you can get the efficiency up. Uh, and you can get the efficiency up to levels which are, I mean, Oxford Photovoltaics, the company, about to start marketing them this year or next year at very, very high efficiency, which means it needs less land. Uh, if you put them on the roof, you can get more roof uh, out of it and less of all the uh, other supporting equipment. So there are ways of getting it better, but they're not huge advances in the pipeline. Thank you. We have a few more questions to go. And this question in that sense is asking about whether the hydrogen residential heating is possible, and then about the same battery um, development. Okay. That's a very good question. So, um, most of the gas pipes, uh, if you put hydrogen through steel pipes, they become brittle. Uh, but most of the gas pipes in the country are now made of some sort of poly, I don't know what they are, uh, plastic material, which can be used higher than a 20% blend. But a 20% blend would already be something. You've got to refit all the gas fittings. It's, I mean, you can't just have for 20%, maybe you could just use that in your existing boiler or your existing, um, you know, in your existing cooker. But if you go higher than that, which are people are advocating, then you have to replace all the boilers and the infrastructure. Now, that's been done because when I was an undergraduate, gas was town gas, which is hydrogen and carbon mon monoxide. Very, very dangerous stuff, actually. Um, uh, so we already changed all the gas once when we got out of uh, town gas into natural gas. We'd have to change it back again. But the, the, we certainly could go to 100% hydrogen. The question is, would it be worth it? And my impression is no. First of all, uh, I mean, I, because I know the cost of using heat pumps. It looks to me as if it's going to be cheaper. Uh, you can't do it anyway. You've got to be on the on the gas network to do gas heating in the first place. Uh, zinc ion batteries you've asked about. I don't think so. I don't know of any uh, development with the zinc ion batteries. Uh, in our study that I'm leading, we haven't looked very seriously at batteries because we're looking at large scale storage. And they're, they're, batteries are very expensive. They're never going to store energy on a very, very large scale. So. Uh, I can't. I, I can't tell you anything about zinc battery developments. There are some developments, and there are sodium ion batteries and other types of battery which look use cheaper materials than lithium, which could be quite promising. Thank you. Clearly, um, these types of new technologies, such as hydrogen, is very meaningful in terms of net zero. But again, these type of transition cost is highly. Um, dependable, which sorry, wait a moment. Can you move me to that question? I can't see it. On oh, the final question. So, the final question is for international carbon adjustments. How would that work for developing countries, which does not have historical responsibility for emitting GHG? Well, that that's a very good question. Maybe it shouldn't be there. I mean, the pro the problem with carbon prices that. All economists agree that it's the best way to get emissions down, but of course, they're not popular, so they put up the cost. So the various things being discussed internally, uh, there's a scheme in Canada, not every province, but in many of the provinces of Canada, and also in Switzerland, which is to give rebates. So you say, everybody will pay a carbon price, but 
everybody, every, every single person, or maybe every taxpayer will get a fixed rebate. Now, the good thing about it is it's redistributive because it's the rich, the affluent people use most energy. So they will pay most if there's a carbon price. But if everybody gets the same amount of money back, this will be moving money from the rich to the not so rich. And it'll make the carbon, the, the rich don't care if the cost of energy goes up a bit. The poor do care, but it'll be bringing the cost down. So that's an idea that's being used in Canada and Switzerland, but it's not been entirely as popular as one might have expected. Internationally, uh, I, I personally like the idea of border carbon adjustments, but I mean, I think, uh, you know, we have to encourage developing countries not to get into heavily carbon emitting exports. They should be encouraged to get into things like making ammonia, actually, which you could do in a country like Namibia very easily, or Egypt, where there's plenty of solar power around and exporting that. But, it, but development is the big problem. How do we reconcile uh, global justice with decarbonization? Good question. Thank you. I think that's most of the Q&A session. Thank you for everybody who have joined us in person or via online, Facebook or YouTube. And thank you, Chris, for this amazing presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.